Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. This week's video, we're gonna talk about holster selection. Now, I've been carrying a gun professionally and personally since I was about 21 years old. Um, I've gone through a lot of holsters. This is one of three boxes that I have in my basement full of holsters that I will probably never use again for one reason or another. Now, the reason I bring that up is the firearm's important. If you think about the firearm for a self-defense purpose, then you know that the gun needs to be maintained and kept in a secure holster. Uh, if you carry concealed, retention isn't that big of a deal, which we'll get to. Uh, if you're going to open carry, then retention, at least one level of active retention, needs to be considered. Uh, those of you out there carrying open carry in Phobos holsters or Uncle Mike's or holsters that offer absolutely no active retention, you're idiots. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. You are idiots. Uh, I know that may cause some butt hurt among the open carry community, but if you're in any kind of semi-populated area and you're carrying in a non-retention holster and your face is in your cell phone, and I've seen it, I've stood behind some of you guys in lines at gas stations. Absolutely zero situational awareness with a holster that, let's just be honest, is the cheapest holster you could probably get your hands on. You paid $20 for it and probably got change back. And you have absolutely no control over that weapon. Uh, it's in a holster. That, granted, that's better than nothing but it's open carried and there's no retention whatsoever. There's a reason why law enforcement and those who responsi responsibly open carry use an active level of retention. It is a basically a way to purchase time in the event that someone attempts to take your firearm. Now, if you're gonna open carry as a recreational shooter or hunting or being out in the woods or wilderness or whatever, is retention that big of a deal? Um, I still consider that having at least one active uh, level of retention on an open carry holster is a great idea. Uh, I can't really think of a reason why not to. Um, it's been shown in study after study after study after study that you can be just as fast with proper practice or faster from a level two or a level three retention holster than a zero retention holster. So if, you, if you're not spending a lot of time practicing your draw stroke, which there's really no reason for that because you own the gun and the holster, and I'm sure you have plenty of downtime, um, then maybe you're thinking, well, the open carry is going to give me a little bit of advantage. It's not. Um, trained versus trained, you can be faster or at least just as fast from a level two or level three retention holster. And we're talking about your personal safety here. Some mistakes you can only make once. Now that's all I'm really gonna say about open carry because this video's main purpose is about just holster selection for those of you maybe considering a new holster or who are buying your first firearm, self-defense purpose, and you're thinking about, well, what kind of holster should I get? Um, so as far as open carry goes, I think we've covered that. We're, we're done with it. We're not going to talk about that anymore. Uh, for concealed carry, uh, you don't necessarily need to have an active level of retention. It's not a bad idea, but the firearm is concealed from the general public's view. So that is a level of active retention. If they don't know you have it, then they can't attempt to take it from you when you may not be as situationally aware as you should be. Uh, if you're in an unknown environment, you're standing in line, you're in a crowded area, you're something like that, the gun is concealed. So if you do happen to kind of slip up and, or what have you, or maybe you just have other things you have to worry about and you're in your cell phone or you're doing a transaction, or you're pumping gas or something like that, since the firearm's concealed, that's a level of retention. People don't know you have it, therefore they can't attempt to take it from you until its presence becomes known. Now let's talk about the popular holster types. Now first up, of course, is leather. Uh, I bring leather up first because I've been using leather a lot longer than I've been using Kydex. Um, you think, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years ago, Kydex wasn't as prevalent as it is today. Uh, leather is actually my favorite holster material. Um, it molds much better to the body, comparatively speaking, than with Kydex. Uh, but it does have some drawbacks. It, there is a break-in period with a quality leather-made holster. There are some patent leather or molded leather holsters that you can buy, like Tagula or Bulldog or those. Those are pretty much crap. Um, generally speaking, if, if there's no break-in period, then the leather is not going to be high quality. Now, since this is a, an organic material, it does over time mold to the gun, so it's not going to, comparatively speaking, or relatively speaking, I should say, last as long as Kydex holster. But some of the obvious advantages to it are is it is a little bit more comfortable, it molds to the body a little bit better. One of the big disadvantages, though, is unless there's some kind of um, secondary composite material built into the holster, it's very hard to get a light bearing holster in leather because what I mentioned, it's an organic material. It's going to mold around the gun over time. So if you were to make a light bearing leather holster, eventually it would impede or possibly prevent your draw stroke um, with the light because the leather is going to mold into that natural channel. Uh, this is a Wild Bill's Concealment or WBC Holsters uh, Covert Carry. Probably my favorite leather holster going right now. I've used Galco's in the past, which is also a really good holster brand. 
uh, but the WBC is very versatile. I can do hip carry and I can do appendix carry with it. And it's got a it's got a V breech, so if you want to, you can actually tuck your shirt over it. So what to look for in a leather holster inside the waistband? Uh, a wide clip which helps preserve or helps present or always present your shooting grip, which we're going to get to. Uh, and then just make sure it's an actual high quality dyed leather or natural leather if you want natural leather. You can get these in black, but in humid climates, that dye is going to bleed a little bit. Um, my personal feeling is the thicker the leather, the stiffer the leather when I buy the holster, the better. Uh, if you want to check to see if the leather is legit or not, um, find a place that you're, you're okay with kind of digging into it and see if you can chip off or peel off uh, that surface color. If you can, you're, the holster is probably made out of a patent or a composite leather material, which is not real leather. Uh, like I said, Tagula or Bulldog, those holsters, that's what they're made out of, and that's why they're just not very good quality. Sure, they, they don't have a break-in period like this does, but they're not going to last as long, and the leather is just not going to hold up to any kind of hard use. Uh, this particular holster, like I said, is a WBC. Notice the thick stitching and the large rivet. The larger the rivet, the better, especially. It's an, it's an organic material. We don't want that rivet to pull under, under stress, um, over use, over time. Uh, leather companies that use small rivets, I know it's something small, but price being price, they're going to go for the, the cheapest material as possible. The smaller the rivet, the more likely it is to pull through the natural material. Another thing, obviously, this is just a feature this holster, this particular holster has, but it allows me, if I want to, to tuck a shirt into it if I need to go to a deeper concealed carry. Now, as I'm sure most of the people watching this probably don't carry in leather, um, so Kydex. What's the advantage to Kydex? The advantage of Kydex is it's, it's much easier to mold a Kydex holster for a wide degree of, of makes and brands, and it, makes, it gives you the ability to carry a firearm with a weapon like attached. General leather, just straight up leather, doesn't give you that option. Um, as far as Kydex goes, Kydex, and this is of course relatively speaking, with the holster makers I've talked to, both leather and Kydex, Kydex is easier to make than leather. Uh, it's another reason why you see more Kydex than you do anything. Anybody um, who's watched a few videos on the internet, such as like the Filster videos or videos like that, can learn how to make a Kydex holster and with a little bit of practice get really, really good at it. Uh, unfortunately, some people never actually get good at it and they just put crap out there, which we'll get to. Um, I use Guncraft. Um, Guncap, Guncraft is probably one of my favorite Kydex brands. There's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. I know I've written a review on them in the past and I use them and things like that. Um, my biggest love for, for Guncraft is the fact that he's willing to work with me on small tweaks on the holsters that I carry, like this Arcane model. I think this uh, originally came with the loops. I don't like loops, I like the clips. Um, and another reason I like Guncraft is the suede-like coating that's on the outside of the holster. As an instructor just going through teaching or even practicing or going through classes on my own, this material is very heat resistant, so holstering a hot gun, I'm no longer really burning myself. Now, leather provides the same degree of heat protection, however, leather doesn't allow me to carry with a weapon light attached, which is an issue for me. I gotta have my weapon light. Totally different video. Um, but again, Kydex, easier to make, um, so there's more to choose from. Uh, if you're looking for a Kydex holster, you may think to yourself, well, what, especially for inside or outside the waistband, you may think, well, it's just overwhelming. There's just too many holster companies out there. What should I do? Well, I'll give you some, uh, I'm about to show you uh, an example of a very, very badly made Kydex holster and what to uh, look for when you're purchasing and what to avoid. Now, this is one of the first Kydex holsters I ever got. It's an outside the waistband Spetz gear. Um, the biggest problem is the belt clips were and to the best of my knowledge, still are made out of Kydex. Kydex is not a really good material to make belt clips out of for obvious reasons. As you can see, that broke clear off. Kydex, is, it has a lower melting point uh, therefore, body heat over time is going to make this malleable and eventually it's just going to create an issue where it's going to snap. It's also not as strong as an injection molded ABS plastic or some kind of other polyamide. Uh, so obviously that's an issue. Stay away from Kydex belt clips. Uh, the wider the belt clip, the better if you're going to go outside the waistband. Inside the waistband, same story. If the, the attachment method is made out of Kydex in any way, um, buy a different holster. The other issue is molding. As you can see right here, the mold kind of comes up right there in the magazine release. Do you think that might be an issue? Well, let's find out. If I apply enough pressure to that, can I get the magazine out of the gun? Um, that's an issue for me. Uh, in, this is a left-handed holster because I'm primarily a left-handed shooter. I understand that. But if you think about it, it's going to be the same or potentially even worse for right-handed shooters. If the holster material at all comes in contact with that magazine release, especially those of you carrying extended magazine releases, can I get the holster to allow me to release the magazine? Incidental contact. You bump into something or it's just pulled tight into your body. Uh, any number of ways that contact can be made right here and cause 
it to release the magazine release. Now, is that a huge issue? I'd say so, because in this situation, if I were to need my gun for self-defense, I'd draw out, I'd probably get that round in the chamber, and then I'd have a malfunction. Uh, I'd have to tap. I'd have to rack. Uh, I don't want to have to do that. So this is something to stay away from when you're looking at Kydex. Just two of the things. Now, other factors in, in selected holster, and this goes for leather as well as Kydex, is is it minimalist? Is there a lot of excess material? Are there sharp edges? Are there other issues that's going to cause discomfort? You're going to be carrying this gun, either inside or outside the waistband, you know, depending on how often you carry, which should be as often as you're able, uh, 8, 10, 12, 16 hours. So the, the, the holster needs to be as comfortable as possible. Inside or outside the waistband, there's going to be marginal discomfort efforts. Uh, issues, I should say. But the better made the holster is, the more likely it is that the holster is going to be more comfortable than less comfortable. Um, you pay for quality. Uh, if you're going to spend four or five hundred dollars on a gun, six, seven, you know, or more, uh, you should spend a relatively uh, similar amount when it comes to holster. Uh, I don't believe that there's a very well-made quality twenty dollar holster out there. I just don't. Uh, as far as craftsmanship goes, I believe that anybody who's worth the time they put into their holster manufacturing is going to charge more than that. Now, when you get into injection molded holsters or ABS plastics or things like that, maybe you can get away with a $20 holster and it's going to get you by because it's made by a machine and machines do the same thing consistently every single time. But again, that price point means they skimp somewhere. It may be in the materials, it may be in the fasteners, it may be in the design, it may be in the rounding of the edges, and it may be in the finishing work. Uh, quality holsters cost money. Um, I don't consider a 60, 70, 80, or $100 holster to be outrageously expensive. Remember that you're paying someone for their time, their design, their research, their, their trial and error uh, when it comes to the design of the holster. Now you can get into uh, Gucci holsters. Um, nothing wrong with a, a one-off custom design holster. It's got some kind of monogramming on it or stitching or maybe leather dye colors. It's got a, you know, monograms and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but is the holster itself, the design itself, paying for that craftsmanship. So when you're buying a holster, if you balk at a $20 price, you balk at a $60 price, uh, you should really rethink what you're doing. The holster is going to carry your means of self-defense, so buy a quality holster. And quality holsters are not going to be cheap. Um, the main thing I look for, because I carry inside the waistband appendix uh, generally, or I carry outside the waistband in, in a Sfarland or a, or a, or a duty level holster, um, the main thing I look for in a carry holster inside the waistband or outside the waistband is does the gun maintain a shooting grip? So, holster design, I want to make sure it gives me this shooting grip. I don't want the holster to shift around to the point to where it takes away that grip and I have to rock the gun up before I can get my hand underneath it. A wide clip plus the general design of the holster is going to either give you a shooting grip or if it's a substandard design, prevent you from always having a shooting grip. Right there, that's what I want. I don't want to have to rock the holster up to get my hand in there to actually perform my draw stroke. With this Guncraft holster, no matter what I do, bend over, shift around, I can always re rely on having that shooting grip when I go to draw. Now those are some just really basic things to factor in. Um, I could actually go on for, for a long time on exactly the, 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 the minutiae or the nuances of what draws my attention to a holster and why I select the holster and why I use the holsters that I do. Um, but I've covered the broad stroke, so to speak. Now, I do want to bring up the other side of Kydex, which is injection molded holsters. I know I already kind of talked about them again, or talked about them before, but I think it's worth mentioning again because injection molded holsters are the most, are usually the first holster new shooters encounter, or even shooters who've been shooting for a while are using because that was the first holster they had access to. If you think about it, you go into Cabela's or Bass Pro Shop or Gander Mountain or Academy or your local gun range or wherever you go, injection molded holsters is what you're most likely to find versus Kydex or even leather. Uh, because leather is just not as sexy as Kydex, so it's not carried as much as it used to be for, for some of the newer shops. Um, the most popular two injection molded holsters out there are Phobos and Blackhawk with the Serpa. Now, I don't own a Phobos now. Uh, there wasn't a Phobos in that box. I think I may have one of my other holster boxes, um, but I doubt it. I probably threw it away. Uh, Phobos is a decent holster insofar as holding the gun, uh, but it's injection molded and it's two pieces of riveted ABS plastic that are riveted together that are actually very easy to break. There's a video floating around on the internet, I think it's on YouTube or Live Leak, you can find, where a guy just grabs a guy's another Phobos holster and he just forces the gun forward a little bit and the whole holster breaks off of the paddle. Um, in my experience when I did use a Phobos, and this was you know, when I was 21, 22 years old and didn't know any better, didn't really know any better, uh, it was very uncomfortable. It's not a very comfortable holster, and it's not a very well-made holster. Again, that goes back to what kind of craftsmanship are you willing to pay for to carry your lethal means of self-defense. 
Uh, $20 for me ain't gonna cut it. And I don't wanna put a price on quality, but I think it stands to reason that there's that sweet spot of cost in there where if it's 30, 40, 50 dollars, meh, 60, 70, 80 dollars, meh, it's somewhere in there where the quality is and it's up to you individually to decide uh, what you're willing to spend on like, exactly what I said, uh, a device uh, that's going to carry your lethal means of self-defense, something I'm not going to skimp on. Uh, but Phobos, it, it's, it's going to get you by. Um, I highly suggest carry obviously concealed because we already talked about the whole open carry thing. Um, I don't have as many issues with Phobos as I do with the Blackhawk Serpa. So here's my Serpa injection molded holster. This one's got a paddle on it. Some may say, well, what's wrong with the Serpa? It's got, a no, it's got a level of active retention. Some would consider this a level two holster. And that's great. What's what's my biggest problem with it? Well, my problem is it is is uh, where they put the, uh, the mechanism. The active level retention release is right here. I press that button and when the gun comes out, my finger is more over the trigger than it is on the frame. Not a huge issue, right? But it is. Um, the older models didn't have this channel in them. This channel is kind of there to help guide your finger. I don't know if Blackhawk did that after a few people had shot themselves or whatever. Uh, but if you look hard enough, there's plenty, well, I wouldn't say plenty. There are incidents of people using Serpa holsters who negligently shot themselves in the leg, foot, something like that, or just had a negligent discharge and shot the ground. Is that attributable to the holster? I don't know, but the holster is the common denominator in those situations. Negligent discharges happen when people get ahead of their training or get ahead of their ability. Uh, that being said, this is one of the most common holsters you can find. You can have it for as little as $30, $40, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, depending on where you get it. And the design is flawed from inception. Um, the release should be a little higher, so when you hit it, it would put your finger up here versus over here. If I use the digital tip to index this holster and I draw out fast, what, what happened with my finger? If I'm under stress and I'm applying a great deal of force to this because i got to get my gun out fast, a little bit slower, hit the release, drag back, finger is going to follow that channel right onto the trigger. Can I avoid that? Some people say, well, you can train around that. Absolutely, I can train around a negligent discharge. I should be spending my entire life training around the possibility of a negligent discharge. That's exactly what this holster is, is a potential negligent discharge. So I'm not going to use SERPAs. I'm not going to recommend SERPAs. And I do keep somewhat of a watchful eye on students in my classes that are using them. Uh, can you train around that potential? Yes, you can. However, it's so much easier just to not use this kind of holster at all. Now I know just bringing up the Serpa by brand or maybe some of the other brands I talked about may create some uh, some butter. Uh, so people who own Serpas or who carry Serpas, who trust their life to Serpas or Tagulas or Bulldogs or Spetsky or some of those other holsters I mentioned. Um, be very careful, uh, and this is just my, my advice, be very careful when it comes to defending any product that you use. Um, if it's not factually based, if you're just using it as an emotional knee-jerk reaction saying, well, I have a Serpa and it works fine for me. Okay, but quantify what works fine for you and if you can objectively recognize, as with the Serpa, how this could potentially create an issue with the way that the, uh, the release mechanism is designed. Um, Tagula, Bulldog, how much did you pay for it? Is the holster holding up? Is it is it a month old? Is it two months old? Is it three months old? And you're already seeing wear and stitching come out and the leather's, the leather's kind of cracking up and you're going to have to buy a new holster soon. Um, think objectively about the holster. Think objectively about the issues that I brought up. And again, this is just my personal, my professional opinion. You may disagree and that's fine. We, we can disagree and that's okay. Uh, but do so factually instead of emotionally as with any other product. Um, as far as Serpas go, don't care for them. I right, kind of already talked about that. We don't really need to be to death. Uh, holster selection in general is something that you should actually put a lot of thought into, just like you put a lot of thought into what kind of gun you're going to carry. Your objective, factual, weighing the odds, you know, your caliber choice. Do you want a single stack or a double stack? Do you want night sights, fiber optic sights, blackout sights, RMR, weapon light, no weapon light? All those things should be thought of objectively and factually and weigh the risk versus reward, pros and cons. Um, but again, holster selection is something I've written on, but I want to do a video on it because it's something I take pretty seriously. Um, your holster is going to carry your means of self-defense, so it should be a quality holster, just like you should carry a quality firearm. Uh, people will scoff at the $150, $200 high points and then run out and buy a $20 uh, neoprene or nylon holster. A universal one-size-fits-all uh, Uncle Mike's or a Blackhawk. You notice I didn't even bring those up because I don't even consider them holsters. I don't think about them at all. It's the same as basically putting a small metal clip or plastic slip on a stiff sock. That's all you're getting. Um, it's not a holster. It's just a little gun pocket that's very poorly, cheaply made, and it's sold to people who don't know any better. 
So hopefully this video helps you know better and buy a more quality holster. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Buy holsters accordingly.